Welcome to Fear Free Childbirth Podcast with Alexia Leachman, the weekly nine-month podcast to help parents-to-be look forward to their fear-free childbirth. Alexia is a pregnancy and head trash clearance coach and the author of Fear Free Childbirth, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy and a Positive Pain-Free Birth. As a mum who's had two fear-free and pain-free births, Alexia wants to share with you how she overcame her pregnancy and childbirth fears so that you can look forward to having a fear-free birth too. Over the nine-month life of this podcast, Alexia will be sharing some real-life stories from mums and dads, insights into the latest childbirth research, inspiring tales from birth professionals, and some tips and techniques for clearing your fears and stresses. If you would like to receive a free chapter from her book, then head over to fearfreechildbirth.com, where you can also sign up for her email series, How to Have a Stress-Free Pregnancy. But now, it's time for the show. Hello and welcome back to the Fear Free Childbirth podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leachman. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, on today's show, I've got a brilliant, brilliant guest for you. Today, I'm going to be speaking to a doula. Now, I know that I've been mentioning, talking about doulas quite a lot. In fact, a lot of my guests, some of the mummers that have been sharing their positive birth stories, many of them used doulas. And I know that I've, you know, I've had some emails from people saying, what is a doula? Get a doula on the show. And I've been trying to get a doula for ages. But, you know, doulas are very busy ladies and they've got things like births to attend. And so they can fly off at the last minute. And so some of the times we've had in our diaries for some to, to get some interviews in haven't always stuck to plan. And to be fair, that, that's been a lot to do with my end as well, because I've got little kiddies that have been ill. So it's not easy trying to get a doula and a mum of a little baby together to do an interview. But we finally did it this week. And this doula interview is fresh out the box. It literally happened in the last few days. And it's a brilliant one, which is why I just wanted to get it straight out. Today, I'm going to be talking to Lisa Jane Meridew, who's a conscious birthing doula based out of Brighton here in the UK and what she's going to share is just simply fantastic and I think she does credit to all the doulas out there so if you're a doula listening to this I think you're going to be really pleased with what Lisa Jane shares but before I share that brilliant interview I just want to say a big shout out to Kelly who sent me an email Kelly's a listener and I just want to she has said that she's so glad that she's found the podcast she said she's 20 weeks pregnant with her first child and she said that this podcast has been a lifesaver and that she's already started to feel better about her journey through the pregnancy and her upcoming birthing process. And she's super grateful for my work doing this podcast. Well, thank you for listening, Kelly. And thank you so much for emailing me and letting me know because you know what? Sometimes I sit here recording the podcast and it's just really great to know that people are benefiting from it and are finding it useful because it's easy for me to forget that sitting here in my office with my microphone all on my own recording these podcasts. But I just trust that people out there are listening because the numbers, the downloads we're getting each week just keep getting bigger. So I'm sure I must be doing something right, but it's always lovely to get an email. So thank you, Kelly, for taking the time to write in. Right now then, I'm going to now, without further ado, hand over to the time that I spoke to Lisa Jane Meridew, who is a conscious birthing doula here in the UK. You're going to love this one. Get yourself a cup of tea and some biscuits and sit, put your feet up because it's simply fabulous. It really is. On today's Fear Free Childbirth podcast, I'm speaking to Lisa Jane Meridew, who's a doula who works out of Brighton in the UK. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. Hi, thank you very much. Well, I'm so pleased to have you on because I've had so many positive birth stories from mummers telling us how it went, and a lot of them work with doulas. So it's brilliant to have a doula on the show. I'm so excited about this. So, but before we talk about doula stuff, can you just tell us a little bit about how you came to work as a doula? Yes. Um, I had my first two children when I was 18 and 19, so a very tight age gap there of 13 months. Mm. And um, that was quite a journey because it would have been easier to have had twins than two in 12 months. Yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> one sitting, one walking, one running, one pinching. All in nappies. <laughs> <laughs> two lots of potty training in fairly quick succession. <laughs> And um, and then I had my last child, Georgia, when I was 26. So we had quite a nice long age gap there, which was wonderful. Mm. Recommend that age gap to anybody. 
Um, and also because you know what you're doing. You're yeah. much more relaxed. You're really sucking eggs. Yeah. Um, and it's like having an only child all over again. So it was a mm. deeply joyous experience. Uh, and then through time, various friends were in early labour or wanting help or advice and my nickname at school was mother right and it's kind of gone along hence doula mama ah oh, okay in the name that i've called myself and um everybody would just come all their problems all their issues i myself had um a disabled daughter so i was traveling the journey of what does that mean mm. as well? And so it opens your experiences and horizons massively into mm. all sorts of personal journeying, family dynamics, uh, how the NHS works, and then battling through the education system with statemented children. So in and amongst it all, I was helping friends in labour, <laughs> attending them, that happened about five times, I guess, and I had thought about being a midwife, but at the time I realised, you know, you can't choose your clients, and my children are too small. So years later and a few careers after, um, I was at my daughter's house because I delivered my eldest grandson. Oh, lovely. Um, along with my son as well, so we had a real family delivery. Oh. A bit emotional here. <laughs> oh, no, it sounds lovely. <laughs> And it really awoke, again, the beauty and joy of birth. Mm. And it's a difficult thing to be a mother present in your daughter's birth, but actually my own spiritual beliefs carried me right through the whole experience. And one of her friends, Kat, had a baby, and I went round there and I could hear this baby going, <coughs> I was like, oh, good God. Get that baby off that breast. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that baby got a hair lip. And she, uh, sorry, I said, does that baby got tongue tie? And she said, oh, my God, how did you know that? And I said, darling, you do not hit your 40s without experiencing most things around children and ailments. So I said, would you like me to show you how to put the baby on the breast and breastfeed with tongue tie? And she's like, oh, my God. Why weren't you a midwife? <laughs> and so she happily got the baby breastfeeding the way she needed to. And I just sort of said, because I can't choose my own clients, and I would like to. I think it's energetic. Mm -hmm. And they said, why don't you become a doula? And I looked at my daughter and her friend, and my daughter just said, my mum is the best person you could ever want in labour. She's funny. She's hard, she's caring, and she's loving. And she'll make you feel like you can do anything. Wow. And I thought, doula it is then. Brilliant. <laughs> so how long ago was that then? When did you become a doula? How long ago? 2010, I trained okay. as a doula. It's not a journey for the faint-hearted, because each of you has your own story. And what leads you into helping, supporting and empowering women in childbirth. And it takes continual study. I have a partner and youngest daughter left at home, exasperated by the amount of learning I go off to do, which I'm sure they think I don't incorporate. <laughs> but it's really important to be always on, on, not on, just on your game, but everything's new and the latest and the greatest. But it's also about, for me, returning back to ancient, sacred and traditional ways that we, as a world, have really lost touch with because we don't live in strong communities and our family don't all live in the same village or the same few streets. Mm. We don't gather as women round the table and it's really important making making us rebirth back into this kind of support in a world that demands now, now, yes, yes, go, go, must have, must have. Mm -hmm. So it's about being slow and gentle and letting all of that go around you mm. so that you're at your pace. Mm. 
So what would be, if someone really didn't, had never heard of a doula and really didn't know what a doula was, you've mentioned about, you know, supporting and empowering women through childbirth, mm-hmm. but how, what, what does a doula do? Or what, you know, if, how, how do you go about supporting a woman through that, that time in her life? Mm-hmm. So a doula defies every role and all descriptions, but is everything. Okay. And I really have to start it off there (laughs) because it's such a true thing. (laughs) A doula is, she is a birth educator and she will spend a a great deal of time. You know, we we see our parents, well, I see my parents a minimum of two times prior to birth often more Mm. Um, because we need to know about your birth stories that were passed on to you both you and your partner Mm. because that tells us what you're carrying forward into your own labor just to begin with so you mean their own personal birth story their own yeah arrival into the world yeah and then we look at what they've learned about birth and how they're bombarded with so much information Mm. and we debrief their births or any births that they've previously had because we don't always capture the first time mums Mm. often as not we're second time onwards when they've had a horrendous experience or have had a birth trauma or are really unhappy with how they were treated they weren't heard so our job is to certainly we're signposters Mm. so that we want our parents to make informed choices you know we're not there to advise but we're there to help you make you know firm choices that are with lots of knowledge and warmth and understanding and Mm. sometimes academically very much statistically for some parents Mm. you know it's all about personality types Mm. and we're certainly there to empower them and we're certainly there to empower dads and I think it's really important that dads a doula isn't there to get in the way of the dad she's there to support the mum and the dad Mm. and and how we birth is absolutely all in the birth preparation i believe and for dads it's a very scary place they've got no conception of what they're about to walk into or watch their partner go through or the range of emotions they're about to feel Mm. and it's good as a doula, if you've done lots of, you know, active birth, massage, you know, I I help with acupressure and homeopathy, you know, if we're all, but that's if people want it, you know. Some people are very much, this is how I want my birth to be and that's how it is and, and so it will be. Mm. But we do bring an awful lot of holistic stuff in with us. Mm. Um well, certainly I do. I can't keep saying we all do because we all don't. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me that there's there's very much there's that you mentioned the education role. So sort of educating mm-hmm. people, women around birth, which you know one thing is very clear to me is that the education that exists around childbirth for women is pretty much zero, and they get that maybe from the movies or from TV shows like One Born Every oh. Minute or something. Yes. And so, you know, <laughs> it's not, not ideal as a basis, really. So I guess you've got a kind of a big task in just that education piece alone, haven't you? Yeah, it's a massive task. And um, one screams every minute, as I like to call <laughs> yeah. it, is, I, and I really want to share this with people that do watch it and are frightening themselves to death because I've just dealt with a young mum who is petrified of her labour now and birth because of that programme, that it is done and directed. The midwives are told to tell the parents to scream. It is very directed. Okay. It is not a raw, natural filming of birth. Mm. Um so please, mums, don't watch it. And if you do, treat it like EastEnders, you know. Yeah. It's got a script. Yeah. Um, well, I, I started a petition on um, Change.org to petition Channel 4 to portray a more balanced view of childbirth. Absolutely. With programming, because there's there's some childbirth producers and, you know, that are trying to pull together some documentaries portraying a more balanced view that, that don't seem to get a whole series given. They might just get one episode. And mm. yet, one born every minute, is rebooted season after season and it's just so damaging for women going into that labor time you know 
And I firmly believe that we need to see a more balanced view of childbirth within where women are essentially learning about this really important event that can have such important implications on her well-being, her child's well-being, the family's well-being, you know, and we're leaving it to chance and things like one born every minute to do the job. It's quite tragic. It, it really is a big problem. And with the NHS cutbacks here, when I was having my first two, I think I went for 28 NHS pre-birth trainings. I think wow. then it went down to something like 12. We here have gone to two and are about to go to zero. Mm. We've also gone to not looking, this primary care trust here, you're no longer allowed to go and walk around the ward and have a look at where you're going to birth. You have to do it virtually online. So you're actually already putting fears in place because you don't actually really know where you're going to birth. Mm. You've just got a room to look at. There's no contact with midwives or in terms of in situ. Mm. And I think everything creates a vibe that doesn't necessarily bode well within you because if you're not ready psychologically, your labour will reflect that. Mm. So I think doulas have really strengthened in their importance around mums and dads and even grandparents, actually, in reassuring them of the journey they're on. It's a rite of passage yes. from woman to mother. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a tremendous passage. Mm. In the same way that I work with um, Mama Birthart, because if there's issues sitting around you that you haven't dealt with, we need to get them up and out and dealt with so they don't occur and raise their head in labour so that you're in a most balanced and strong place you possibly can be to take on what's really going to be the truly most bodily exhausting piece of work you've ever done yeah and yeah. mentally stretching <laughs> so what kind of things do you think might show up in labour that you're is there anything that can you can sort of share with us examples or something yeah there was a birth recently not one of mine um but a doula sister of mine where the woman kept saying you know i'm not sure if my husband can support me and she spoke at length with her around this and she was immovable and not wanting to particularly work with it which was a source of worry for us because we had to try and work out how would we best support somebody in that scenario and uh, it emulated in labour right at transition, which is usually where if there's grief or fear or something going on, it suddenly rises in the mum. And she suddenly was grabbing at her husband and didn't want to give birth because she didn't think he could hold her emotionally mm. post-birth. And they had to do a lot of work in an hour and a half with her to enable trust between them. Mm. and a loving space for the baby to be born into. Wow. And a nut, which is a really kind of extreme example there, but it's actually what can happen. If we've got abused mothers, it can suddenly fly up in and around transition. Um, and certainly with mothers, you know, that are pregnant after a loss and now labouring, the loss often comes in transition as well and and it's about acknowledging the loss and differentiating and allowing her to feel peaceful to move on and birth her baby mm. so what i'm hearing is that essentially you know in the lead up to birth a lot of that preparation needs to be around that emotional piece to try and clear and, and let go of some of those fears not only from a birth perspective but from a broader life perspective because they're likely to come up in the transition period of labor is that what you're saying absolutely and sometimes it will it will whack out in the postnatal period all mm. of a sudden it's all there because you you you're in the most overwhelming place of all and if mm. there's mother issues which often there are you know if we deal with them in pregnancy beautiful we don't have them coming forward into your relationship with your baby mm. or child and motherhood. 
No, it's really interesting because one thing that I certainly, when I was pregnant, I used both of my pregnancy journeys and certainly my first one to just work on so much of my own mental stuff mm. that I used that journey as a, I, I literally wanted to just clear the emotional decks as it were so that I could start with an, a, a clean emotional slate with my first baby and not bring forth all my head trash, I call it. Yeah. And, and also have all my buttons there ready for her to press. <laughs> which, Absolutely. You know? Um, and so if you can use your pregnancy to kind of do that work so that you can lay the groundwork for a great birth experience or minimise the likelihood of all that stuff hitting you in the face, like you're saying in transition, but then to ease that journey into motherhood as well so that you can do it from a place of calm rather than a, having all this stuff come up, you know, that's certainly... And I think all my work did pay off. I've had wonderful birth experiences and mothering certainly didn't feel as hardcore as I I hear from other people so it sounds to me like you're sort of that that sounds like something you would recommend absolutely Mm. absolutely at the Mm. end of the day we we really all want to have a calm peaceful birth Mm. so going back to your work as a doula then Mm. Mm. because one thing you you're a birth doula but you're also a postnatal doula so just expand a bit more about the kind of work that a doula does how she supports women um and and the fact that you do postnatal work as well do you mind just talking a little bit more about the kind of you know how how that looks like so for example maybe in the birth period the actual birth or the postnatal period yeah so basically we will have built our lovely relationship with you before you go into labour well hopefully mum and dad will be feeling really strong and excited and ready to go in that labour whether it's at home or in hospital or a home birth centre and then postnatally I come out usually about day three or four because we're all aware the baby blues may or may not come Mm. and I do say may not come because we don't need to manifest it to come because it isn't always there at all Mm. and I'll have a lovely little chat with everybody and we'll talk about the birth or around the birth if mum and dad are ready and wanting to. Sometimes mum needs the gaps filling because obviously she's been labouring and she's only got bits of the jigsaw and she needs a few pieces putting in. Mm. (laughs) And sometimes that's just in timings. Um, And then we're looking at how is she breastfeeding or is she bottle feeding? Um... And is she comfortable with the choice she's made? Because it's really important for mamas to be comfortable with their choice and not browbeaten if they're not breastfeeding or can't for a reason. What matters is a happy, calm, healthy mummy and baby. Mm. So we'll be looking at that. How she's sleeping? How's dad? Dad, how are you? Do you need to go for a walk and a talk? Which I do do. Do you need a pint? Yeah. Do we need to go and sit in the pub and just ugh together? Yeah. This sounds like a great job. <laughs> and and it's just about where is everybody at? Mm. And then what help do they need postnatally? So whether they want me to come in as a postnatal doula, whether they just want to keep in touch by phone, which I'm still available for anyway. And mm. latterly, I've begun to use Skype postnatally. Ah. So, you know, I had a mum recently, I can't get the baby to latch. I said, get on Skype, let's have a look at what you're doing. And we did it via Skype, which was hilarious. (laughs) You know, thoroughly modern Millie, me, 47 and catching up with the times. (laughs) So you just love Skype, brilliant. I just have to. So I'm there for that. And then what we're offering there, really, it is continuous emotional, mental, spiritual and physical support. Mm. And, you know, we can do things like come in and just hold the baby while mum goes for a bath. Yeah. Just mum wants to iron for an hour. Yes, that's lovely. Or she might want me to iron for an hour. Why would she want to iron? (laughs) Because some people just want their routine back and it's a way of grounding. By just having a bit of your old routine can Mm. be quite grounding for you. Um. Or she wants maybe family to come round, but she needs the doula there to exit them. Yeah. Which is absolutely fine. We can do that. We can serve tea and coffee and champagne. We can help you make food for that, but we can most certainly say, Mum's tired now. It'd be good to leave. Yeah. 
And so do you do cooking and, and cleaning around the house, that kind of thing? Would you help in that way or is that? Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's a world of difference between having a housekeeper and having a doula helping with light housework and meal yeah. prep. And it has to be said because sometimes people are a little bit confused about what is the postnatal doula really going to be doing mm -hmm. and what their expectations are. So it's always having a clear, clear boundaries. And sometimes you do do a lot more. You know, if you've got a mum with severe birth trauma, you know, you might go in and do three or four dinners in a row for them and just say, you know, should I get these done for you and get them freezered? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's get you some easy life going on here. Mm. Um, certainly, running an errand, going to the post office, banking checks, anything that will just take the pressure away and leave mum and dad bonding with baby, mm. Mm. which is so important in those early days. Mm. One of my, I've uh, got some positive birth stories that mummers have shared that I've interviewed on the podcast here. And one of the ladies that I spoke to, Jennifer, she said she had a lying in period and she had a doula coming in to help her during her lying in period, which just sounded like it was about six weeks period. Yeah. So, um, and I thought when I heard that, I was like, wow, I, I would have loved to have that kind of support. When Absolutely. It sounds incredible to be able to have that come, people coming in. Like you say, when we don't have the support of family, around us you know certainly I don't have any kind of support near me so to have a doula coming in like that would have just been fantastic I think yeah I think it's critical and there's a yogic practice of the 40 days post-birth and it's about laying resting acknowledging it's about integrating the self mm. and the new environment mm. who am I who am I now learning to bond with this baby and your partner and how your relationships changed you know just really allowing everything to just be mm. and it's so important and I can imagine a lot of people going yeah but I've got to go back to work and this and that but actually in the old days we would have been surrounded by our grandmothers our aunties our mums sister-in-laws sisters Everybody would have been in and around the house in that period to help. Mm. And it's it's just one of the ways we've lost. And the fact that we as doulas can come in and just provide that extra nurturing support is a wonderful, wonderful gift. Mm. Mm. For us, as much as it is for you mums, yeah. to be able to help that. Absolutely. So let's just go back to the sort of the moment of the birth then. So mm -hmm. typically, um, when would a... When would you get the call, let's say, that you're, you know, that, I don't know, to, to come along and, and be there for the birth? What, what point would a mum call you? What, when, when they're in early labour? Yeah, or? is that like, yeah, when you've got to sort of turn up and, and support them during that birth time, when, when do they so, get in touch? Right, so and it really depends which number birth we're on. Okay. <laughs> if we're on birth and how confident we are as mm. well in our ability to birth and labour, and whether actually they've even got a birth partner or whether the doula is the birth partner. Okay. So for some mums, they might want you as soon as they're 25 minutes apart. Right. For other mums, it would be really, we'd say, give us a call when you're 15 minutes apart. Hmm. I like mums to ring me when they've got early backache and they've possibly lost the plug yeah. so that I'm alert and ready. I know that we're looking in this 24-hour period. For some mothers, they'll ring you at five minutes apart. Can you get here? Yeah. Which is great when you live close by. Yeah. Um, and they're confident to do that because really we're, we're right into active labour now. We're really getting in there. Mm. So, but generally I would say probably 15 minutes apart is when most mums would ring. Okay. And so when, when you rock up at the birth, yeah. what kind of... What 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 might you be doing to support mum and dad during that period? Okay. What's so, happening? So before I've even left the front door, I've just had a nice shower and cleansed away anything that's been going on, even if it's the nighttime sleep. And I'm just grounding myself and getting into that really mindful, peaceful presence, connecting in to the baby that's now coming and into my family. So I have a nice little drive over or taxi ride over depending where they are and then as we come in we're just peaceful you're listening a doula's job is about being mm. 
not necessarily doing mm. when it comes to labour. Okay. And like midwives, we're listening. We know that certain sounds tell us we get into certain points of the labour. So for some, it's hysterical and it's laughing and dancing and we're shaking our booty and we're getting down with every contraction and we're heading in for an ecstatic birth. Yes, mums, listening, it really does happen. Yeah. And <laughs> it really does. And for others, it might be peaceful classical music and it's just gently rocking and it's very peaceful. Other mums like silence. Mm. So you can find a mum under rebozo, mm. curled up in the kitchen. She's gone into the cave. Yeah. And she's not coming out and she doesn't need anything from you. She just needed to know you were sat in the other room, right. just being. Mm. So it can take on all sorts of shapes when we walk through a door. And again, that's partly some of that's in the preparation mm. as well, kind of knowing where they're going. And it's always being prepared for change. Yeah. Because all change can happen in a split second. Yeah. So it sounds, just from what you just described, sounds to me that, like, maybe, is there a, a preference of home births when doulas are, in, are, are taken on board? Or do you see a kind of equal split with home birth and hospital births? Or Actually, there's a very big difference between our rural communities and birthing and our city and town birthing mm. and their attitudes. And I serve both. So our rural girls, just to give you a little statistic, 60% of first-time mums in the Kent area were recently opting for home birth or home birth centres. Wow, that's huge, isn't it? It's massive, and it shows a really big trend. And I looked at it quite deeply and spoke to some of the girls. A lot of them are from big families, and everyone else home birthed. So there's something about the story of how you were born, mm. which goes back to my beginning of what is your birth story yeah. and your belief systems. Some of it's a confidence in the community midwives who ours are absolutely wonderful, mm. both rural and town. And it's about changing how we birth. You know, with every birth, we change the earth. It's really that simple. And we're teaching our children a story when we birth, especially if they're at home and they're all around the tub watching or joining in or they're asleep but they knew mummy and daddy were going to have the baby downstairs by the fire. And it's, and it's different here. Certainly in Brighton, they're at 8% home birthing currently. Um, Did you say 80, 80? Eight, no, 8. 8, eight zero, okay, 8. Yeah. Um, and it's certainly becoming more and more asked for. I, I prefer home birth in a lot of ways, and I think if you've had a good pregnancy, there's no reason not to go for it. Mm. You've got two midwives with you all the time. You've got a doula, your birth partner, and emergencies, you know, they're really few and far between. And to give you a little statistic here, Last month, of the 20 home births attended, um, 17 did it at home. Wow. Perfectly well, not transferred in. Three were transferred in and nobody had an emergency. Mm. So demystifying home birth, often the transfer in is because they're averting anything from happening or there's a sign that it possibly could. Yeah. So they're not going to sit and wait for it to happen. Yeah. Those mums, as those three did, go on to have a perfectly normal delivery with nothing more happening. So it does change depending where you are mm. in your areas. And, and it's also about mindset. Mm. Hospital is safe. We've been programmed for a very long time. Hospital is where to give birth. Mm. Or you're mad if you don't have a private obstetrician. What are you doing at home, you know? Yeah, I have that. <laughs> And and a lot of biases mm. towards it, which are born of the era of the 60s and 70s and 80s, really pushing hard that hospital was the place. Mm. And interestingly, we see Holland have just made home birthing law unless you have a medical reason wow. to go to hospital and birth. Mm. Mm. We, I believe, will see the UK follow. And I don't necessarily mean because 
the they will be doing it out of all of our best interests and all the rest of it i do think they'll use it as a financial lever as well yeah. because there's a big push currently for people to say would you like a home birth when you go out well it does cost significantly less isn't it to have a birth at home absolutely yeah. and yeah. do you and your baby really need that experience you know there's nothing more beautiful than you know having a lovely bath run by your doula mm. hopping into bed you know the midwives are there for three hours post birth we clear it all up we we make it all beautiful you're tucked up in bed with your baby and your husband you know the the midwives will leave after three hours and doula will leave when mum and dad feel ready mm. and sometimes mum and dad actually can you keep on the ssofa we're just not sure of course <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially first-time parents, like, what? Yeah. We've got a baby. What do we do with this? Absolutely. So, of course, I kip on the sofa. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. how does that differ then to the hospital birth experience? Like, I would imagine that there's a very different when you walk in there and you may be dealing with, you know, the consultants and the sort of the medical teams maybe getting involved or sticking their nose in or... I guess your role might be slightly different or you find that it's different parts. You need to do different stuff when you're in that hospital environment. Is that right? I think, I think there's a world apart from a home birth and a hospital birth. You know, if we look at the positives of home birth, we've got mum and dad very relaxed. They're at home. They've got their TV, their bath, their music, their food, their fridge. They're at home. You know, home we learn from birth is a safe place to be. Mm. So energetically, when we're in hospital, we're, we've got a temporary bedroom, shall we say, which actually doesn't resemble one and has an awful lot of medical equipment floating around <laughs> in it, <laughs> which can be quite scary, particularly now mums aren't getting these hospital visits in. Mm. Um, and so you're sort of, you can demystify that. Some mothers just go in, this is what they want, it's where they feel safe. If, if there's anything, I think there's been... There's confidence growing in doulas present at births with midwives. I think in the past it's been difficult on many levels by many different things that have happened between doulas in the midwifery system and confusion about their roles. I'm very clear in my role. The midwife is God and what she says goes mm -hmm. and the same is with an obstetrician. Mm -hmm. My job there is purely supporting and sometimes having to be an advocate for both. So if something comes up and they want to do a procedure, we you know, we need to be looking at benefits, risks, asking our questions, do we need it now? What would happen if we waited half an hour? What would happen if we waited half a day or twenty four hours? What other procedures could we have as an alternative, you know? And it's just helping the parents ask those questions sometimes mm -hmm. rather than being bowled along in a very clinical world that is used to being very clinical and that that is the answer. Mm, mm. You know, so do we need to top up the epidural or do we actually need to get mum on her all fours and change position and just see where we can get her to yeah. before we give in to the Kiwi Cup, say? You know, it's, yeah. it's just looking at everything. Mm. And I think it's, you know, once the midwives realise, you know, you're just a gentle, peaceful person, just helping and you're actually working with them, you know, I always offer tea or coffee to the midwife. I have always got food and make sure she's getting fed like we are along the journey because mm -hmm. our poor midwives may not get a wee in their 12-hour shift, never mind a cup of tea. So it's kind of just about all being there together for one common purpose, yeah. supporting and empowering mum for a good positive birth outcome mm -hmm. as best possible. So when mum maybe hits <clears throat> some challenges throughout labour, for example, I don't know, maybe she gets, maybe in the transition where she's like, I can't do this, or, you know, any kind of, or maybe if labour slows down or maybe stops, mm -hmm. is, is that a time where maybe you might sort of step in and start supporting her and, and maybe helping things get going again? Or what, what how would you might support her in, in times like that? Absolutely. That's absolutely where we come back into our own again with mum, because there's a number of reasons a labour slows and in some cases stops. Mm. And sometimes it's purely the body has just laboured quite hard for a while and says, right, I'm just going to stop. Yeah. I'm going to regroup myself. I'm going to regather my strength. 
and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to help you birth this baby. Mm. And so, we, you know, we have to look at what's really going on, whether we've had lots of interruptions, lots of door openings, lots of change of midwives, what's, a, what's you know, what is accounting towards this stop, shall we say? Mm. Um, you know, do I need dad to be getting a bit raunchy and loving with his wife with us out the room <laughs> you know nipple tweaking and all of that yeah. and lots of lovely big kisses and and just reminding him quietly maybe outside of the encouraging words he can be using mm. because I do a dad training anyway okay. so that my dads always know what to be saying and what definitely not to be <laughs> saying so that they don't get screamed at with what would you know yeah <laughs> Coaching is out, dads. Encouragement is in. <laughs> <laughs> the only coaches are the midwife and the doula. <laughs> and, it, and it's just about looking at the oxytocin. What do we need to get this going? It's feeling where mum's at. Is something coming up? What's mm. coming up? Why has that come up? What can we best do to help you? Mm. And so I think it's quite a, a long, it can be quite a long journey in that moment of just resettling and getting it going, you know. So when there are women that have got really, really long labours, you know, you hear women that have had labour going on for 40 mm. hours, 50 hours, whatever like yeah. that, are you going to be with them the whole time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that must be quite tiring for you as well. Well, it really depends. It's all about, you know, as a doula and with experience, you judge things. So... It really depends what's happening because it's very easy to lose track of time in a labour room. And one of the things we do as doulas is we keep an eye on the time, drinks, last lots of food, regular breaks for dad and for ourselves. Right. So that we are topping up with really healthy, nutritious drinks and food and maybe go for a shower or a walk. I mean, if it's really going on and it's very it's just latent at that point you know it's not unusual to take a yoga mat curl up with your blankie and go to sleep and then make dad do the same right so that you're resting you know six hours maybe each mm. just as long as somebody's awake and they're supporting mum mm. mm. whereas if we're at home and we've got a labor that's long and drawn out you know that early part shall we say um be lots of nice things it will be having baths. You know, recently I lent Paddington to one of my mums, the new Paddington film. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. <laughs> she was rocking with laughter and it got her going enough, you know. Yeah. It's, it's just about getting the oxytocin, oxytocin, oxytocin mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about an ecstatic birth earlier. I did speak to somebody. Mm -hmm. when I, I did a laughter yoga training uh, a couple of years ago. Um, no, no, I think it's when I was pregnant, actually. And one of the ladies on the course said that in her birth, she had all her sisters there and they were just having such a laugh during yep. the birth that she was just laughing the whole time and she had an orgasmic birth. And she said it was the best, like, feeling that she'd ever, mm. ever had. Absolutely. And, um, yeah, so I just, I'm just, you know, and I remember thinking, wow, you know, I, I managed to have a pain-free birth first time around. Maybe second time I'm going to go for the orgasmic birth. I'll just laugh my way through it, but it didn't quite go that way. But I'm curious that you mentioned ecstatic birth and I'd yeah. love to hear more about that because, you know, have you got any stories to share on that? Yeah, there's a mum uh, last summer who was deeply excited with a very wanted baby and she was just like christmas eve every single day for the pregnancy oh, wow. and she was just as i speak she's like la la you know 38 days to go six hours and counting and she really stayed in that joyous joyous conception space all the way through and then it was hi I'm in labour. Woohoo! And that was her message on the mobile. Brilliant. Do you need your doula yet? No! Woohoo! I'm doing it by myself. You go out there, birth pool, first time birth. She's prancing around the front room. Woohoo! I'm a surge closer to my next baby coming. And like real mindset. And that girl was busy in between contractions going, do -do 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 -do. it's coming. And this is a girl that's doing one minute apart and pushing. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
And you see that kind of laughter, and I'm sure everybody's laughing listening at my description, <laughs> but that is the oxytocin level you can have. Yeah. So when I go out and we're talking about birth preparation, how does that birth place look to you? How would you like it to be? One of my favourite things is to, because baby showers have really taken up in England now, and we, we're very American in what we're now doing with diaper cakes and all sorts. In fact, my daughter's just done one for one of her friends. But I like to bring it back more traditionally that if we looked at our girlfriends in early labour and we rang them all, even if it was the middle of the night, because we've all got six or so girlfriends that are hankering to be a birth partner, it's like directing the energy into coming round early labour, we're going to be stopping every 20, 25 minutes, maybe every 15. Hey, everybody, bring the ingredients. Let's make a birth day cake. Oh, wow. And so all the women are gathered in the kitchen. They're making this cake. They're chatting. They're laughing. They've got the music on. So we're already building that lovely ecstatic oxytocin energy up, which, of course, is feeding mum's brain to produce more oxytocin to get that labour going. And they decorate jam jars and put messages on there and put tea lights in. And then mum might have, if she has an altar or a place of focus, they, they've got photos there of people that mean something or give them strength or people that can't be there but were inspirational. Mm. And then when mum really sort of goes, I can't be doing with this anymore with all these people, <laughs> <laughs> the doula gently removes them. And then what she can do is when she needs the energy or strength of one of those friends, she lights the candle, the jam jar with the message that was read, oh, just wow. written just for her, for her to read in that moment as she starts to go on her journey, deep and down and bringing that baby through. That's amazing. And, and we can all do this. Mm. We can all do this. And so it's not for everybody but it's a great way of sharing the early birth and it's a good way mum and mum-in-law often want to come and you're thinking I really <laughs> don't want that audience <laughs> however if we build up an early labour pre-birthday cake party yeah. <laughs> everybody was there energetically everybody was there yeah. and then they left mm. And there's no ill feeling, there's no hardship. And what, what we have is a circle of women that are now at home sending their energy, their love and their prayers into the safe arrival of mum and baby. And there it's done. Mm. Beautiful energy to surround yourself and your partner and your baby mm. with. Mm. Happy birthday. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, um... Going back to this lady that was whoop whooping, the ecstatic, mm -hmm. what was her birth like then? Like when she actually... She was in the, bar, in the birth pool going... Yeah. Doo -doo 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 -doo, <laughs> yeah. Between her contractions yeah. when she came up for air. Yeah. Pushed away, really easy. Baby really? out, baby in. And, you know, just stood cheering with overwhelmment and love and like, you're here, I love you, welcome. Wow. Just literally got up and kept walking, you know. It was just Amazing. incredible. Amazing. So, again, birth preparation, being clear in yourself, having a really good marinade of love for that baby to grow in and for you to be pregnant in. Yeah. And coming earthside with a great deal of love. Well, Lisa, it's been absolutely fantastic listening to you sharing more about what doulas do and, and everything. And also the, the stories that you shared have just been fantastic. Now, I know that because we had a little chat before we came online and you said that you do, you travel for your doula work as well. So I know that, you know, you're based in Brighton, but you will travel far and wide. So do tell us how far will you travel to help people at their birth? <laughs> well, I can now travel abroad safely. Um because there are times when people are living abroad and they actually do just want... It's a bit like having a British nanny. Yeah. They want a British doula and they want their own tongue and their own culture with them during birth. Yeah. And so now I'm in a position where I travel and stay away for a month to five weeks, running up to, during and just after the birth 
for Mums Abroad, which is fabulous. Mm. And I'm starting to travel more up country. I certainly serve London and places. Um, we generally we're an hour away, but it depends whether I'm staying there and how the birth's been planned as to what I'm doing. Okay. So it's really exciting just being able to travel and just be with mums. Yeah, no, fantastic. And then to make to give her a proper cup of tea. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> Some countries, they don't know how to make tea. So, um, <laughs> and our milk. I can no. even take our milk in my suitcase. <laughs> don't, don't get me going. I take tea bags with me now because I just want a decent cup of tea sometimes. Absolutely. And um, so... <laughs> So, yeah, so what is your website then? What's your website, Doula Mama? Do tell us. It's www.doulamama.com. Dot com. Okay, I'm going to have a link to that on the podcast show notes. And you can find today's podcast show notes at fearfreechildbirth.com forward slash doula Lisa, where you can listen to all this again, because I'm sure people are going to want to listen to this more than once, because you've just had so much wisdom and stories and just really, really great stuff to help women really get their head around I think preparing for birth because it's such a momentous occasion and well worth preparing for so if there's any mothers listening to this is there one final or one parting piece of advice that you might want to offer to a mum who's pregnant right now a mum to be who's pregnant yeah if doulas were a drug we'd all be addicts get one <laughs> fantastic well thank you so much lisa for coming on the fear free childbirth podcast much much appreciated pleasure thank you thank you for tuning in you've just been listening to alexia leachman from the fear free childbirth podcast if you enjoyed the show she'd really love it if you left a review on itunes or stitcher or shared it with a friend And don't forget, to get a free chapter from her book, head over to fearfreechildbirth.com to get your copy, as well as finding other episodes in this podcast and more about how Alexia can help you with pregnancy and birth preparation coaching. Until next time.